Professor Schwartzchild is the Director of Creative Writing in the English Department here at UAlbany and a longtime fellow of the New York State Writers Institute. An acclaimed author, his books include In Security, Responsible Men, and The Family Diamond. He's also the frontman of the alt folk roots rock band Dr. Baker. We're grateful. <laughs> We're grateful to him for introducing us to the work of Elizabeth Graver, and now he will introduce her to you. Please welcome Ed Schwartzschild. Hi, good evening. It's so great to see you guys here tonight. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, and thank you, Mark, for that introduction. I, you know, I've been trying to keep my band life, you know, more of a, a, a secret, but it's nice, to, it's nice to have it out in the open now. Uh, so, but don't worry, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sing. Uh, though maybe we can get Elizabeth to sing. I mean, the book, as, as, as Mark has said, is so musical. Uh, but uh, I, I've known Elizabeth for a long time. I'm not gonna say how long, uh, but I'll, I'll just say that when I first met Elizabeth, I had a mullet. Uh, my hair was down to here. Uh, so it was that long ago. Uh, we met at the, uh, at the at gra in graduate school at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I was in the PhD program there and Elizabeth was in the uh, MFA program. And the MFA program was where all the cool people were. Uh, if you were at WashU in St. Louis, I think it holds true at just about every English department. Uh, you know, if you're looking for the, the cooler side of the English department, you know, just drift towards the creative writers. Uh, uh, I think you know I'm, I'm biased, but I think that's true, and and at that time the MFA program at WashU was it's still really highly regarded, but and 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 has been for a long time. But back then there were real luminaries uh, holding court uh, at that program, and uh, for poetry it was Howard Nemiroff, who you know was poet laureate and, and uh, has won all the kind of poetry prizes you could win. Uh, and in fiction, it was a, a writer named Stanley Elkin. And if, if you've read his work, you've, you've probably laughed out loud and just marveled at his, his sentences, uh, just the, the sort of quintessential writer's writer. Uh, but he was known for kind of uh, running workshop in a, in a tough, critical way. And, and people would leave workshop a little bit, you know, with their, their, their posture would be kind of affected in a negative way after after workshop uh, but the the story and, and you would hear stories you know you would, people would come out of workshop you'd hear stories later in the, the bars of st. Louis or what have you about what had gone down in the in the workshop today uh, but the story that you would hear about Elizabeth Gravers for I think it was the first time her, her work went up at in the in the workshop at, at WashU with Stanley Elkin uh, they, they talked about the story and, and Elkin uh, essentially said, look, this, this story is ready to send out. Go ahead. You're done. Uh, send it out. And uh, so that, you know, that, that sort of gave an early indication of, of what kind of career Elizabeth was going to have. And, and since then, the, the stories that she wrote at Wash U uh, went on to win the Drew Hines Prize, which is an, a phenomenal prize for short story collections. Uh, and since then, she's published uh, five more, five novels. This Cantica is the fifth. I think I, I think I got the numbers right. And uh, and they, the the novel before this, the the end of the point, which is out there as well, was uh, long listed for the National Book Award. Uh, she's her her short fiction and and nonfiction has been. Uh, anthologized in the Best American Collection. She's won a host of other awards and fellowships, longtime professor at uh, Boston College, just you know, across the Berkshires. Uh, she's been uh, an inspiration, and, and uh, you know, I'm just filled with admiration for her work, and we're, we're so lucky to have her here with us today. I'm, I'm excited to uh, just to talk with her and to, to listen to your questions to her and also to hear her introduce this book. This book came out, I mean, just last week. So we are among the first to get to hang out with Elizabeth and talk about her book. Uh, we're at a time in the book tour where she hasn't heard uh, the same questions over and over again. So everything you say is going to be new and exciting. Uh, so it's just a, it's a great moment to to get to spend some time with with Elizabeth and hear about her new book. And I, I just have I, 
I just want to say congratulations, of course, and, and to her. And also just that we're, we're really lucky to have her here. And it's, it's a great thing for the university and for the Institute. The Institute has had a phenomenal, yet another phenomenal season here. And this is, this is a lovely way to, to sort of get towards the, the end of the season. Uh, so I think that's all I wanted to say for now. I have more questions, but I'll get to that later. For now, let's just please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Graver back to you all. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all for being here. Is this good? Can you hear me well? I'll lower it a little bit. So it's a great pleasure to be here, great pleasure to get to see Ed again, your work, and you have been an inspiration and accompaniment to me over these many years. And thank you to Mark and to Jennifer and to the university and all of you who came. Um, so I think what I'd like to do is I'll, I'll give you a super brief introduction to on the one hand, my brand new novel. On the other hand, my very old novel. You'll see why I'm gonna why I'm saying that in a minute. Um, and then I actually wanted to show you this little video, five minute video that I made with a little help. Um, and then I'll read. Tell me, I can't quite tell. I think that was just a car. But if weird things happen with the noise, like <laughs> flail or something, um, uh, then I will read to you a little bit and. Um, then we'll have a conversation and questions. So I've already, Evelyn? Yes. I've already had one fascinating conversation on my way in. So um, there'll be more. And I, I love the back and forth part, so I'm not gonna talk for too long. But um, I'll give you a little introduction and then we'll show the video because it actually d does a lot of introducing. When I say this, was, this project has been a long time in the works, you know, I don't actually remember that moment of Stanley Elkin saying my story was done, but in general, that is not my experience of writing. My experience of writing is that things need lots of revision, lots of time. Um, so this novel, which came out last week, as Ed said, I kind of started when I was 21 in 1985. I'm not going to hide my age. I'm 58. Ed's 23. Um, so that was a really long time ago. And when I was 21, I interviewed my maternal grandmother, Rebecca. Her maiden name was Cohen. Um, then her first married name was Baruch. And then finally, when she married my grandfather, it was Levy or Levy, telling stories. And you're gonna, the reason I wanted to share this video is because it contains some of her actual voice. And this project for me has been an incredible, kind of conversation more than any other book I've written. I do a lot of research. I, I have two other historical novels and I love doing research. I love traveling for quote research trips. Um, they really are, but you also get to travel. Um, I love interviewing people. I love oral history. I love learning about things that I'm not an expert in. So my work the sort of research side of my fiction is something that I've done for lots of other books, but this book is complicated for me in that it's at once the closest to home and that it's r arising out of my own family story. First time I've written a full length book like that and incredibly far afield for me in that it takes place in Turkey, Spain, Cuba, and Queens, New York, none of which are places where I'm from. It contains multiple languages, so Ladino or Judeo-Spanish, which if you don't know is the language that the, um, the Sephardic Jews who were expelled from Spain during the Spanish Inquisition and went lots of different places, but in my family's case, and your family's case, the Ottoman Empire. Sorry, Evelyn, I'll stop, no, I'll stop highlighting you. Um, <laughs> I was excited to meet you. Um, and um, and um, so Judeo-Spanish or Ladino is a language that contains the a kind of base of old Spanish mixed with a lot of, it's its own language, but mixed with a lot of contact languages. So um, Turkish, French, Hebrew, Arabic in some cases, and it, there's different versions of it depending on, on where the communities were. So Cantica, the title of my book, means song in Ladino. Um, and as I was saying, this project was both very far afield for me and very close to my heart. So it took me a long, first it took me 
decades to turn to it. So I had these recordings. My grandmother was a very talkative, vibrant person. I knew she had had a long, hard history and also had a kind of appreciation, a pluralistic appreciation of different cultures. And she spoke multiple languages. She was very open. She seemed really different from my other beloved grandmother, who was Ashkenazi Jewish, and and just had a totally different culture, ate different foods, spoke different languages, and kind of inhabited herself very differently. So her body, the way she talked about things. So my grandma Becca, as you'll see um, in this video, when you hear her voice, was incredibly open um, and and talked to me about when I was really quite young about bodies and sex and pain and you know bad men and beautiful men and all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect a grandma to like sit in the corner with her kid and I was avid I'm like tell me more you know um, <laughs> both as just a curious child but also as a writer like I was like this is really interesting and I, I felt I think I, for, I wanted to be a writer since I was little and I knew that there was something there and then I also found my grandmother quite confusing because she was Jewish but she wasn't Jewish like the other side of my family and she wouldn't use the word Sephardic she would use the word Spanish she had lived in Spain which is a very unusual twist for my family story because most Sephardic Jews were expelled from Spain and didn't move there you know but she would lived there for a decade um, and she'd gone to Catholic school in Istanbul and spoke French. So she was this kind of extraordinary melange of things um, and very expressive, but also kind of had a lot of pain and, and, and had a lot of sorrow in terms of what she left. Um, so all of that made me want to interview her. I had these cassette tapes. I asked her a bunch of questions um, and then I sat on the tapes for decades and I wrote several, you can sort of see traces of her in some of my work in various ways that are probably mostly just apparent to me. And I wrote one poem that overtly featured her in one essay, but mostly I went and wrote about a whole bunch of different things. And then a decade ago, I decided to, to try to write this as a novel. And I think it was partly because at that point I had just written a historical novel that was quite ambitious and involved a lot of research and I felt more confident. I don't think I would have been willing to or able to take on such a big subject before that. But it was also because of what was happening in the world, the worldwide refugee crisis and just watching kind of the movement of people, watching what was happening with US immigration policy. I knew that my grandmother had been separated from her sons for many, many months during one part of her migration. So I was interested in kind of how this story from the past both echoed and diverged from where we are now. And then the, I think the other reason, and I, I did talk about this a little bit this afternoon with a different group, I was drawn to it at this point was my own getting older and then my mother who's 86 now and uncles who two of whom um, were central to me in interviewing and getting material for this book and very important to it and died before it came out. But one of them I actually, my uncle David, I got to read portions to literally during the pandemic over FaceTime as he was lying in the hospital and he kind of gave it his blessing. So it's an interesting novel for me in that it really is a novel. It's fiction. It's filled with made up characters and certainly made up inner life, but it also has um, lots of truth in it and lots of real names in it. And many of the major events are based on things that I either I know happened historically or in lots of cases I know actually happened to my family. So it, it's a duet, um, which is another reason why I like the word cantica, because it's, it's another musical term. And you can see, if you look at the actual book, and we're going to put a photo up at the end, um, or after the video, that I include um, photo, family photographs in it. So it's a book that from the very beginning says it's a novel, but troubles that a little bit, right? It's like, if it's a novel, why are there photos? Who are these people? And those were all, I'd be happy to talk more about it, but those were all things that I did intentionally, almost a little bit like 
these tiles, right? Like they're there, they make a beautiful pattern. If you look really closely, they're also broken. They're glued. You can see something of their history. I, of course, did not design the cover, but I love it. Mark, when you talked about indigo, I said to Ed, that's my favorite color. Um, I want to go to the, I want to sit in Toni Morrison's chair and go to the indigo workshop. <laughs> guys are really lucky. All right, so we're, we're going to show a video. Um, I think I press, Jennifer, just, I press this little right arrow key? Yes. Okay, so it's five minutes, and, and so the main reason I want to show you this, it's got photos, but it's got my grandmother's voice, and so you, I just feel like in this, you can't hear her voice when you're reading the novel, but it, it matters to me when I can to share it, be, because it's a key part of this. And, and I, I did put subtitles because she has a strong accent. She's a little hard to understand. when I was 21, I taped my grandmother, Rebecca Levy, telling stories. I'd always known she'd had a challenging and colorful past. Two husbands, six children, many countries, multiple languages, and upheavals. But there was so much I didn't know. I knew she was Jewish, but was she Turkish or Spanish? The fact that she was an embroiderer of both fabric and reality was common knowledge in our family. Was she telling the truth when she said she'd been born rich and lost everything? In my interviews, I asked her many questions, though not nearly enough, and she offered me many glimpses of her life. In 1925, after having moved from Istanbul to Barcelona, Rebecca married Luis Baruch. In 1928, he abandoned her and their two infant sons and returned to his home in northwest Turkey. Eventually, he summoned her, but she arrived to discover that he had died while she was on her way. And see, women coming, people coming, they were coming. I say, Oro, I said that was his miss, his miss name. Oro, I say, what are these people coming over here? He say, no, don't worry. He said, they'll tell you what is it coming. So when a woman came next to me, she sat down right next to me. She said, my sweet, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry what happened to you. She said, it happened to me the same thing. I was very young when I lost my husband. He said, it happens to me. What do you mean? He said, that I lost my husband? The way you talk, don't talk to me like this. I was telling you. He said, yes, that's what happened. And all of a sudden, I fainted, and I went down, and that's all. And I, 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 I don't remember anything else. Well, I got married with, uh, I have a sister over here living in uh, America, and she was, yes, Corinne, and she, she sent me a letter, <clears throat> he told me that uh, uh, there is a, I know I have a friend over here, very nice man, and he lost his uh, wife, and his wife was a woman that I was very friendly with her. We live in the same country, in Turkey. We live together, because she came in Istanbul. And I have uh, two sons in Spain that uh, the war started, and I couldn't uh, get And finally, we went to the American Council, and uh, he told us, uh, were they born in uh, Spain? I say yes, in Barcelona. So, and uh, the council say, okay. They say, we'll bring them over, don't worry. I started to cry, I was so nervous, because I was carrying a uh, baby.
died in 1992. In 2014, spurred by the worldwide refugee crisis and by my own sense of time accelerating in middle age, I returned to her story. I traveled to Turkey, Spain, and Cuba, interviewed relatives and strangers, read books. I stared and stared at family photographs. In the resulting narrative, I used photos and some real names, but I wrote the story as a novel, full of inner life and invented scenes. My grandmother used to tell me that I had big ears because I loved to hear her stories. The fact that I've ended up with a big mouth as well would not surprise her. De boca en boca, she might have said in Judeo-Spanish, from mouth to mouth, from hers to mine. And uh, the, I tell you the truth, you know, the whole story, because you are you not a child, you can, you can understand. attempt at filmmaking. I did get some help, but um, it, it felt important to me to, to have her voice, you know, to, to get to share that in some way. There's a lot more of her voice, but um, you can, should I, do I need to click something here now, or we could just keep you her. You want it on the red slide, right? I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can stay on the phone. Um, yeah. So, so, so that's that's just a glimpse. Of, and so, some of those photos, but not, not all the photos are in the book. And there's other photos in the book that aren't um, that you didn't see. And just very quickly, I want to say one thing about one of those photos. One of the things that was so fun and interesting for me with handling the photos was looking at them really closely, not just their fronts but their backs. So the first photo, um, which is the one with Rebecca as a little tiny girl standing there with her siblings and actually someone behind her that looks like it's her mother, but it says on the back that it's not, it's her cousin. Um, I could see the insignia from the photography studio on the back, and so I did some research and found out that it was an Armenian studio, um, which is, you know, interesting and moving, particularly given what happened a few years later in Turkey with the Armenian genocide on Rupera, which was a kind of fashionable district. Another photo, the one of the t of her with um, with her two little boys, when it says they were left in Spain. I had, I had seen that photo my whole childhood, it's of my uncles and her, but I never looked at it really closely and when I did I realized a few things. One was that they were still in Spain at that point. She left them to go for an arranged marriage. She wanted to check out, given her terrible first, I'm giving away a little bit. <laughs> It's not that plotty a book. It's more about character. But um, she uh, she left her kids in Spain with her parents to go to Cuba to see if this arranged marriage seemed like a solid thing. But the photo was taken in Spain before she left, and there and she was an incredibly she earned her living as a dressmaker. She was an incredibly good seamstress, and they are wearing sailor suits that say U.S. on the patch which I thought was really fascinating. She must have made them. She must have thought, I, I, my, in, in the book, I have her send that photo to her prospective husband, kind of being like, here are some American sons for you. They were so not American, these children. You know, they, they were Turkish Jews who, land, they were born in Spain, but they weren't quite Spanish either. They, they were stateless, actually, at that time. Um, and then the back of the photo, and I found this incredibly moving and actually argued to get it in the novel and lost. Um, <laughs> my editor didn't want it. But um, says, they're in English, misspelled, they're in Spain, my darlings, with a New York accent, right? D-O-L-L-I-N-G-S, because she was just learning English. And although she was multilingual, English was really hard for her to learn. And I think it's because it was the last language. She was having babies every three seconds. She, had, she became the stepmother to a child with a lot of physical disabilities. Um, so she just couldn't ever quite, even when I knew her, you can hear, she struggles with, she has a beautiful voice and a poetic way of talking, but English was, she was never quite comfortable in it. So I found that, that she would at that moment in 1934 be trying to write in English and spelling it wrong, spelling their wrong, which, you know, so do my students, it's, it's a little hard. But, um, but also spelling doll, darlings, D-O-L-L-I-N-G-S, darlings. I just found that so 
moving and beautiful and it shows such effort and such a desire to try to figure things out but not quite able to do it. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit because I think it'll be fun to talk um, and hear, talk to Ed and also hear people's comments and questions. So I, I think I'll read just from the beginning, just the first couple pages of the novel. Um, so it starts in Constantinople in 1907 and there is an epigraph does anyone here speak Ladino? Okay, so I'm not going to worry about my horrible accent. Um, I also don't speak Spanish, which would help. I speak French, but it, in Ladino it's Deschame entrar y me azar lugar, let me enter and I'll make a place for myself. And it's a Ladino proverb. If someone spoke Ladino, I wouldn't have dared. But, um, okay, so Constantinople 1907, and, and this chapter opens with the um, with the picture that was the first one. Rebecca's a little girl. This, the beautiful time, the time of wingspans, leaps, and open doors, of the heedless headlong flow from here to there. This, the time before thought, the world arriving not as lists or hearkening back or future tense, but as breath-filled music, cantar, sing. Rebecca sings to the rhythm of the oars as the boat delivers her to school, and in school with the nuns, tournez vos yeux vers Jésus, and climbing ropes at Maccabee Gymnastics, hand over hand, and wrap your feet, girls. But what draws her up is less the instructor barking commands or the strength of her limbs than the unspooling thread of her own voice. In wordless tunes, nonsense sounds, ballads, in Ladino, French, bits of Turkish, Hebrew, Greek, she sings. As on the street, the lemon man sings lemons, the Bulgarian sings pudding, the vegetable man sings eggplant, squash, and artichokes. Fresh, cheap ladies, how I wait for you with my aubergine. She sings in school in chorus and for daily hymns, and at night her mother sings the children to sleep, duerme, duerme, querida, ijico, sleep, sleep, darling boy, though two of them are girls. If the dull-eyed nightingale rarely makes a chirp, still her father stops by its cage most mornings to try to coax it into song, and he sings at synagogue, you've given me a throat that has not gone dry for calling out to you. And one strange morning after services, he leads Rebecca to the ark, and she sings to the men below and the women above. Her voice is unwavering as the cushioned freedoms and unspeakable good fortunes of her childhood. Still, her grandmother sews a bondric bead to the underside of every collar to ward off the evil eye. Their house has three stories and is made of stone, which does not burn. Down the slope is Balat, where the poor Jews live, but her family lives at the top of the hill in Fener. Their neighbors, Greek diplomats, Armenian doctors, Jewish bankers, and traders like her father. And it is with the daughters of these families and a few equally prosperous Muslim girls that Rebecca and her sister Corinne go to Catholic school. From their bedroom, they can see the brick tower of the Greek school for boys, and below it, the minarets of mosques, and beyond it, the golden horn, with its blinking lighthouse, and Haskoy and Galata on the other side. Downstairs, a stream of people come and go, the dormer invitation than barrier, men arriving in the evening to join Rebecca's father in prayer. And it's only after the guests kiss the mezuzah and file out into the dark that he locks the door and shuts the iron gate. So that's a little glimpse of just the beginning and her rather kind of flowy, connected world where cosmopolitan, it's not perfect at all, and she's a child, so she has a somewhat limited vision of it, but the family's quite prosperous, um, and, and there are, you know, a, a lot is kind of working for them. Um, then um, various things happen. The Ottoman Empire collapses. Her father loses his factory. He's not a good businessman in the first place, but there's also all kinds of things going on politically in Turkey in in the um, in 19 around 1924, which is when they leave. Uh, Jewish boys or young men are inscripted into military service, but not given given sort of terrible posts and not given 
kosher food and there's a lot of discrimination and the kind of evening the, you know what is sort of passing as a republic is in fact for minority populations of various sorts very complicated like sufis and 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 you know the armenians it's a disaster before that greeks are being sent away there's just all sorts of things going on so a lot of jews left at that time um and my in real life my grandfather had already left at that point in 1924 my grandmother's family tried to leave and there it was very hard to figure out where to go because um there was a uh, immigration Act in the United States in 1924 that shut out all kinds of very racist act that shut out all kinds of people including both Turks and Jews um, and um, so anyway they end up you'll see they end up going I already sort of gave this away going to Spain so I'm just gonna read you a teeny little bit of a scene where Alberto who's a character based on my great-grandfather who I never met but found incredibly compelling to imagine it, his perspective um, has figured out been given a job in Barcelona as the caretaker of a unmarked synagogue um, and he feels quite ashamed he's an old man he's 25 years older than her mother than Rebecca's mother and this is not what he wants to happen with his family it's not where he wants to go but it's kind of the best prospect he can find um, so in this scene, let me just look at time because I don't want to take up too much time. I'll read just like five minutes. Um, in this scene, Rebecca comes in and finds her parents in the garden and starts kind of begging them to ask, to tell what they're talking about. And she can tell that they've been talking about something and she starts to figure out that they're going to leave. She's noticed that her father has been selling off things in the house, selling books. Um, her sister Corrine is already in Cuba and her best friend Lika is in New York so she thinks maybe we'll go to those places um, and and um, she so she says are we going to America and her father says no um, not America she looks disappointed to Cuba then with Corrine he shakes his head France Again, he shakes his head. Where, Papa? Just tell me. Why must you torture me? Sorry, let me just pause. This is the photo for this. She's this age, okay? And she's wearing this kind of crazy getup um, that she made. Sultana makes a tisking sound. He looks towards his roses, which need to be pruned. Might he dig them up, roots and all, bundle them in burlap and carry them to Spain? His father is buried across the water in Hascoy in the special section reserved for the Coens, also known as the Coenim, with its scent of wild oregano. Each year, on his father's Meldado, the anniversary of his death, Alberto visits to say a prayer and leave a pebble on his grave. He sometimes wishes he could plant some flowers there. The English cemeteries were full of them, but it's the practice of his people to put stone on stone, and each time it moves him, the tiny rock set on the large one, as if in protest, however small, against the maggots and the worms. How will he add his pebble from afar? I don't know what's happening to my country, he says glumly. It's falling apart, says Rebecca cheerfully. You say so every day. It does seem like I won't find a decent husband here, not without a dowry. But why not America, Papa? Lika likes it there, her childhood best friend. Read the newspapers, Rebecca. America has closed its doors to us. So Corrine will have to stay in Cuba? That was supposed to be temporary. She wants to leave. Where are we going, Papa? Is it Palestine? Wearily, he shakes his head. Is it? Stop, Sultana interjects. Please, both of you. Alberto, why play this game with her? We decided we'd tell them all at once, and we will. Where, Papa? Kneeling down on the grass, Rebecca takes her father's hand, still girlish in her motions, though the spark in her eyes hasn't dimmed over the past few years. But it's changed in quantity, quality. She often seems restive to him, even wild. Sultana stands. I need to start dinner. Come help me, Rebecca. Morocco? England? When no one responds, Rebecca too stands and moves away from them. In the dusk, her face looks suddenly hard. 
to her father, drained of its prettiness, her clenched fists, small gray balls. I've run out of guesses, she says. It's my life too, you know. It's not a game. I can stay here and keep working for the dressmaker or start my own business. I'm plenty old enough. I'll just, her voice turns breezy, stay. You are my daughter, he says. Where I go, you go. Before Re Alberto can remind Rebecca that in legal terms, a daughter belongs to her father until she marries, Sultana turns to him. She's right, Alberto. She has a right to know. Why make her wait? Just tell her. Go ahead. He does not want to be the one to utter the words. It's not his choice, this leaving, though it's at least partially the result of his own actions or inactions. His daughter and wife stare at him. From deep in his pocket, he hears the ticking of his Swiss watch, another thing he needs to sell. Once he releases the words, they will be so. It's Spain, he says. We're going to Spain. Spain? Rebecca laughs, an incongruous sound. But why? Spain hates the Jews. They kicked us out. That was over 400 years ago. Still, I've heard terrible stories. Of course, he says, from ancient history. No, Papa. More recently, I heard they make rugs from our skin. From the skin, she lowers her voice, of Jews. Her mother, still listening, grabs her hand. Who told you that? She hesitates. An old lady I knew, she heard it from someone else. Of course. Alberto downs the rest of his wine. That's why it's an old wives' tale. You want true stories? Look what happened to the Armenians right here. Solid citizens, good people, my business partners. He chops at his throat with the side of his hand. Atrocities, injustices, may God take notice over time. Look at the Greeks. They've been emptied out of half the country. Those aren't stories. Those are terrible true facts. Things aren't what they used to be. You think we'll fare any better? It takes nothing at all for them to turn on us. Where did it come from, this bashing of his beloved country? Though he speaks the truth, he could go on in the next breath to argue the opposite. We're not quite the same as those other populations. Having never made a move for independence, we cower, stay quiet, calle days. Or we are children of Abraham, all one, and then the other side, or maybe a third side. We have to leave because we always have to leave, even if he doesn't remember, not in his heart. He is no wandering Jew. He looks down the sloped garden at his sukkah's skeletal roof, which he wants to plat with reeds again, to hang with figs and dates, grapes and olive branches, so he can study there and later lie on the grass mat with his young wife in his arms as the birds flock for a feast. I can't even go to Ankara for business without permission now. We're running out of possibilities. There's nothing for us here. Well, we have a new opportunity, says his wife, Sultana. De la spina nace la rosa. From the thorn is born the rose. Suddenly, Alberto is coughing, a racking deep hack that appears out of nowhere, bending his torso, taking his breath, a shred of apple skin caught in his throat, or God doing a favor, keeping him from speech. Sultana starts thumping his back, and Rebecca too, and though he tries to bat them away, he's heaving, making small, choked noises, and then is quiet again, his breath returned. He sits depleted in the half-light. I swallowed wrong, he says hoarsely. Oh, Papa. Rebecca bends to stroke his beard, and Alberto senses, looking up, a terrible reversal. She, the child, and a girl no less, is worried for him, the father. It's a brutal passing, and he wants none of it. So Spain, Rebecca says almost brightly, what will we do there? Which city will we go to? Do you have a job? And because there's no rule saying a shamash can't sing, and because he's from the priestly caste and honored with the first aliyah, and because dusk has arrived to blur the edges of his city, the faces of his wife and daughter, the story of his life, he lies. I've been offered a position, he says, as the hazan in a synagogue which is not what he's been offered. I'll stop there. <laughs> Elizabeth, it was so great to hear that. Thank you so much. It's just, it's so beautiful. Thank and you, uh, those of you who haven't read the book yet, you have a real treat in store. I can't recommend it strongly enough. 
Uh, I, there's so many of you here. I want to get to your questions right away. So I'm just going to ask one question, and then we'll we'll just we'll just open it up for discussion. I have more questions. I can jump in as necessary, but uh, I'll I'll just start. I guess I mean just sort of bouncing off of what you just read. The the beautiful depiction of of your your fictionalized ancestors, right? These 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 the, the people from your your history. Uh, I find that so when if teaching or writing works out, people are often tempted to write about their ancestors, to write about their grandparents. A lot of grandmothers, it's oh, true. Right. Uh, and <laughs> and and it's you know it can it can put a you know a teacher in a difficult position because you can tell that students are writing about something they love people they love, people that are perhaps the center of their universe in many ways, and people that they're really worried about losing, perhaps. Uh, but in order to make the fiction work, a conversation has to take place about what is the best way to write about characters, whether they are grandparents or not. And, and, and part of that has to do, I think, with you know working against romanticizing. Yeah. Uh, and or or at least embracing the ability to complicate the depiction of an individual who may be dear to you. Uh, so I wonder if you could talk about your own struggle or or how you how you balanced writing about these people to bring them to life and yet to bring them to life in such a three dimensional fashion. Yeah, I mean that's such a good question. This is working, right? You know, I had no interest. I guess to me, in some ways the best homage to people is to honor their complexity and everybody's really complex so I, I didn't actually feel like it was too much of a conflict in a way I, I the, everyone in this novel is quite flawed um, I mean it did help that a lot of them are no longer alive and can't be upset um, <laughs> but some of them are you know yeah. and so I, I think I also and we talked about this a little in the af afternoon I think the fact that it's fiction was also helpful and that it provides a certain amount of distance for people reading it if you know um, but I did ask many of the central people those who were still with me whether they wanted me to use their real names and they said yes and it's been interesting so far um, you know a lot of the central characters are no longer alive, but my mother is, and I have a lot of cousins who are the children of some of the people in here. And the book just came out, but people are not don't seem upset so far, even though there are some pretty edgy scenes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think I just, when I'm writing, I don't know if this is true for you or for the other writers here, but I do try to the extent that I can to eliminate too much thought of audience, right? I really try to just kind of dive and be there. And with this book, it was complicated because I wasn't just diving in imagination. I was moving back and forth between research and recordings and photographs. So it was a dive, might, it may, maybe dive into a place, but just like like a fish tank filled with bridges. You know, there was a lot of stuff down there. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just kind of in, into my own thoughts. It was in a constant conversation. But I really did try both to draw on what I did know of people. Now, in certain situations, like with Alberto, I knew very, very little. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was my great-grandfather. My mother never met him. My uncles did, but they were little when they... So that was easier in certain ways. And, it, and the book did get harder the closer to the present I got. Mm -hmm. And a couple years ago, I thought I was done. And I had a, the whole last third of the book had all kinds of points of view, including a story that had a character based on my mother in 1957, 1959 at Queens College. And I, I had more material, I had more photos, I had more things sort of pulling at me. And I think I did have a little bit of a thought of like, my mom deserves more of a central place. She shouldn't just be a toddler, like, you know, go mom. And it totally didn't work. Like it just took the book into too many different corners, which were actually interesting. And I could say how they were connected. I don't actually think the problem was that they were too laudatory, but they just narratively diluted it. So I, you know, some of you students or people working on books might not want to hear this, but I ditched it that whole last third and spent two full more years writing a different Lasser. So I think it is sort of interesting that you might originally think like, oh, the early parts, Turkey in 1907 would be really hard because what do I know, you know? 
But in some ways, that was easier because I didn't have all that static, and I, and I had less material in some ways. I had fewer photos. I just had less to work with, which in a certain way made, my, made it easier to imagine. Yeah. So it's been pretty fascinating. Yeah, that it's is been pretty, hard. That is fascinating. <laughs> I can't believe I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like you might have already started the next book. So that, you know, maybe, that, maybe that's where the, you, didn't, you don't have to ditch it, you just put it aside. Well, there are some pieces that could become something else, but yes. I don't know. Not yeah. a sequel. I don't write sequels. <laughs> Do you write sequels? Not yet, no. Yeah. Uh, but, but let's, let's hear some questions from, from you. you. I mean, we've gotten to see a great presentation. We got to hear a beautiful reading. Uh, now, now it's time for some questions. Should I, uh, back there? Jen, you want, I guess. I'm sorry. Um, very short. What part of Queens are we talking about? <laughs> That's so easy. Thank you for the an easy question. Well, I think okay, got more. two parts. There's there's two chunks set in Queens. The first is set in Astoria where I'm about to give a reading a block away from the first apartment. And then the second part is set in Cambria Heights. Do you know it? It's kind of far flung. It's kind of the edge. But the real, the real question is, so did your grandmother know you were turning this, these interviews into a novel? And no. No, because she died in 1992. She knew I was recording her. She knew I was a writer. She knew I made stuff. She wasn't that interested. <laughs> I mean, she wasn't literary. Interestingly, she had a very good education until 11th grade, but she just wasn't literary and bent. My grandfather, who had a fifth grade education, was an autodidact, read Jewish history, read about animals, knew all about the dolphins. Like, he was an intellectual, Monke, but, you know, he ran a shop. He was more interested in, but he didn't want me to be a novelist. He wanted me to be a journalist, because I think he thought, God knows, what if she never marries? How is she going to earn a living, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Where, what do you know? Do you know Cambria Heights? Uh, not particularly, but, but you know a I story? lived in Queens for about 30 years. Okay. <laughs> I, know that. I saw the address there, right? In Long, Long Island City, right? Um, I made up the address in the book because, oh, okay. I, because oh, okay. there are, there, the house is still there, and I thought, not that people are going to start making pilgrimages to it, but to, to, to protect the privacy of the actual lovely family that gave me a tour. And I just thought, I don't have to put their address in a novel. So, you know, I, I messed up the numbers. <laughs> you mentioned Cambria Heights, but that's where they had the Lovavitch. Yes. Isn't that wild? Because I live in Albany. I lived in Albany next to a rabbi who went down there, they bust. Right, now it's become a pilgrimage site, but that wasn't true when my family okay, lived there. So that's why I was wondering, you raised that. Interesting. Yeah, no, that is an interesting, mostly now it's Caribbean, um, the okay. people who live there. It's a, it's a um, mostly, it's still there. But, but right, there is this rabbi, this Lubavitcher rabbi that has a, that people make pilgrimages to. Yeah, different world, but it, it's interesting that he's there. You know, I wanted to continue the conversation that we had right in front of the Starbucks right before the event began. <laughs> Which was about, great. Oh, absolutely. About how cross-cultural identities might affect interactions that people have. And I, as a political science major, you know, when you talk about Turkey, uh, the reference that I have from like 1907 to 1934 is like going from the, the fall of the Ottoman Empire to the rise of like Kemal Ataturk. Right. Um, the 1930s. Uh, in Spain, that's I think Ferdinand Franco. Exactly. Um, yeah. And fascist Spain. Right. Um, Fascismo, as as they would call it, or La Falange, which was like the fascist party that right. ruled the Spanish. And you talk about the 1930s, I, I guess, in, in Astoria, Queens, which covers like the Great Depression, right. and that's everything from between Herbert Hoover to FDR. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, why does the history that that people learn about, which is so far removed from the ethnicity, which is so far removed from from the linguistic identity, which is so far removed from the linguistic identity, you know, how do we overcome those blockages or like those monolithic identities or historical representations? What does it take to get from the macrocosm to the microcosm? So that's a great question. I mean, one of, to me, I'm not a historian, but one of the huge pleasures in writing this book has been actually learning about some of the historians doing work around all of these topics. And there's actually a lot of really interesting work 
being done that are, you know, for, so here's just a tiny example. There's a historian at um, UCLA named Sarah Ebrevaya Stein, and I had seen her work. She's written about Salonika. She's written about, she has a book called Sephardi Lives. And as I was, so I, I sort of was reading a bunch, I read a lot of history to, to write this book. And at some point, really towards the end, when I was close to copy editing, I found an essay, which is that on the ground kind of history you're talking about, called Ruda, which is Ru, the herb Ru in, in Ladino, a plant's eye view of the diaspora, where she takes one little thing, which is an herb, and she talks about what it meant in terms of folklore, culture, superstition, medicine, um, and migration, and how people would bring the seeds with them. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a tiny strand, right? But I actually think that these kind of material culture histories and histories that are looking, and particularly when you talk about kind of um, intersections that are looking at the way that even something like Ladino, a language, was formed because of all of these contacts, right? Like you can see when does Ladino start to change? That's partly when it starts to change in certain ways when there's a minister of education who decides to educate the Ottoman Jews in French, right? Then French comes into the language. So it's all incredibly complex. And I'm sure it's not being taught in like high schools across America, but I do think that there is really interesting work that is much, much more interdisciplinary. And it's coming to literary studies too, American studies and cultural sure. studies. So I'm not so sure about, I know much less about political science, but, but for me, one of the real pleasures of, it's not an academic book, but I did actually discover these historians. There's, for example, there's a podcast that they, they made one about my book that's coming out next week, I think, but called The Ottoman History Project. That's totally fascinating. Like it's just a million different subjects, of, but all through that lens and incredibly interdisciplinary and people from history and English and political science um, all being interviewed and talking about their work. So I don't quite, I, I mean, it, maybe we can talk more later. I don't feel as dispirited about it as you seem to, I mean, I think some of it is what's being taught in the classroom versus what's happening kind of in scholarship and then how does that translate into the classroom. But I have a colleague at Boston College named um, Donna Saji. She's Palestinian. She's an amazing historian. And she's having students make these podcasts now. So she has a whole lab set up. And they're doing, and the person who interviewed me for mine is a PhD student at University of Virginia. So you know, th right. it is actually kind of, I think, that will change the way those people teach and write if they go on in these fields. Mm -hmm. Evelyn. <laughs> and then you. <laughs> Um, so you said you started like doing a lot of this research when you were 21. I'm 22, and I started researching my family history. That's great, so which has echoes with mine. We talked yeah, outside, I was, too. I was about to say, almost every part of that story, I had at least one family member who went through something similar. Wow. My great aunt had to get married in Canada because America wouldn't let her in. Uh -huh. um, like, same, same thing. My family worked in textiles as well. They ran a textile factory and company, and they did trade. But uh, I know for me, like, and maybe it's different because my family history, a lot of it centered around the 40s and the 30s as opposed to the 20s and the 30s in Greece. Mm -hmm. So there's very much that other side where, like, my grandmother told my mother about, like, uh, my father's mother told my mother about, um, you know, the, the how the community was affected by the exchange between Greeks and Turks right. at the time. So, like, we knew these things were going on and they did affect us. And one of my cousins had a father who was Turkish and she got sent to Turkey during the war. Um, but, like, for me, like, learning all of that, it's very emotional and it's very hard. Most of my my grandparents are dead. So I actually had to learn through Showa videos about all of everything that was right. happening. And the only thing I remember my grandmother actually telling me was about this doll. And I started to cry because she said it in the show video and I knew it wasn't made up. Huh. Anyways, but like, what was that like for you? I, obviously, it was a much longer span, like 20 years. But like, learning that history, because like, I know even when I would find out about like great great grandparents that I never met who died, there were like, I would find out things about them. Like, if I was able to track down the actual day that my grandmother was killed in Auschwitz, and I just started to wow. like, sob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also on Rosh Hashanah, which was a whole other thing, and I just like started to sob. Like, it was very hard for me. So yeah. it was like that emotional process, like learning about like these hardships that family members, even ones you didn't meet, went through. 
Yeah, it was really emotional, and I got really attached to the characters. It was such a slow process, so I think the original recordings that I did with my grandmother, it was powerful, partly just because I was sitting and talking with her, and I loved her, and she had... I don't know, I just love at the end when she says, you're not a child, you can understand. Like, there was an intimacy to those conversations that felt incredibly powerful. And it's maybe why I didn't write it for a long time. Because after she died, I was kind of like, this is our thing. It felt almost private. As I was learning later, it took me such a long time. And again, I don't want to give things away, but I, my family was not my direct family deported. They were they were not in the directly, some of them, the more extended ones were, they weren't directly in the Holocaust. They were either in Spain, which had a complicated relationship to it all, or in the U.S. at that point. But, um, but there were some terrible things, particularly the Spanish Civil War, which I, I'm not going to give away because some of it's in the book, but brutal things. But, but I don't know. I mean, there's something about, to me, being, I, I did get emotionally invested, but I don't know if this is true for you, Ed. There's something about being a fiction writer where I'm almost at the service of the story. Like, it, I wasn't so mowed down by this that I couldn't put words to it somehow. It's like I'm a channel almost. I can't quite describe it. But so I, I think when you're making something, it reminds me I have a novel about a beekeeper, that partly about a beekeeper, and I met a beekeeper and I apprenticed myself sort of to him and he took me out. He was an old guy, did this as a hobby, took me out to his bees and put me in a bee suit and opened up the hive and gave me a tool. And I remember thinking if I weren't trying to write about this, I would be terrified. Like the bees were getting in, I was getting stung, but I was like in a zone. I was like tracking. I was picking up the smells and the sounds and I just wasn't scared. So, I mean, it sounds a little cold maybe, but I, I don't think I was, I never like was too emotionally upset by what I was thinking about to write it down. <laughs> For whatever reason, yeah. I think partly for me, when I'm writing, you're you're making. When I say you're a channel, like you're you're attaching words, you're making something. So there's distance is the wrong word because it's incredibly intense. It's almost like meditation when you're when it's going well. Is this? Do you do you understand what I'm no, saying? No, totally. Yeah. So yeah. So it might. So maybe you need to write about it. I mean, that would help you. <laughs> mother actually were joking about writing a story about a Sephardic Jewish woman from Spain who her family converted to Catholicism so they didn't have to leave and then her taking a trip with her father to Turkey because they were doing business and then finding out about the Jewish community. Oh you should that. sounds great <laughs> you should do it. I think I think you had a question yeah yeah should I is it okay if I'm calling on people? Sure. Well I was thinking this before this discussion which plays right into it which you said You've evoked so many clumps of history with these little strands of fiction. And I thought in terms of what the German said before, that historians don't believe this, but because of a fictional character, we can get more involved in history. Yeah. A fictional character can be more completely realized than you can ever recover by a particular person. So history is evoked by fiction in a way that his, factual history can never do. And I think that's what I, I saw here. I, I came here because I'm in search of my rediscovering my identity at the age of 82 and speak. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and it's not, it won't be religious, unfortunately. It's cultural. So I came here because, uh, you know, I know a little bit of Ashkenazi Jews. My father and my mother were from Poland and Germany, but I know nothing about the Sephardic experience except they were expelled. And, um, well, I guess, what was I trying to, I think, uh, probably that's all I want to say. That, that the history of the Jews, to comment not on the literary issue, it seems to me, aside from America and the United States, that Jews are, one part is very rich for well-off people who didn't know they were Jewish and forced to fight out because somebody signals about the central camp, and then the large, large history of Jews, which is Exodus, being exiled, right. being kicked out of the country, having to leave. That has occurred over and over again. That's what your story evokes in such a personal way. Right, and it is a, the, the Sephardic story is less told. I mean, I'm also not religious, so for me, this wasn't a religious exploration. No. It was a. It, it, I'm very Jewish, but I'm not religious. You know, right. we can be that, right? That's very, that's very <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. You mentioned that your grandmothers were totally different. You had an Ashkenazi grandmother, you had a Sephardic grandmother, and I'm wondering when you were writing this book, were you getting noise from the Ashkenazi side? 
She was so much quieter. She was lovely, my Grandma Rose. I am actually thinking about that side of my family and potentially going to write about them. So yes, in a way, but it's interesting in families. It's not just Ashkenazi and Sephardic. My father was an only child. His father died when he was very young. My Grandma Rose, who knows? What's culture? What's character? She was a quiet woman. She was the kindest woman. My Grandma Becca was much edgier. Um, so. There is as much of, I believe everybody has a story, so I think there's a story there. I have much less access to it. My father died in 2010, my grandmother died long before that. I have no cousins on that side. You know, that, it, it, there's a paucity there in a certain way, although I have little bits that are really interesting, like my father's father was in worker circle in New York and wrote for communist newspapers under a pseudonym. Like, there's enough to get me interested but but I didn't have that kind of relationship with my grandmother she didn't tell me stories she she didn't she had had a lot of suffering in her life um, but she, she was American born but her parents were from um, Poland um, but her husband died when she, she raised a single child like she just wasn't a talker so I wouldn't say I feel noise I might feel a little guilt you know because I, I think she also has a story and it's a less, uh, for whatever reason, I was more drawn to the other side of my family. There was something about the food and the music and all the kids and I had all these cousins and the, my grandmother was so artistic and sort of embodied. And so I, uh, even when I was very small, I loved my other grandmother, but I, I found it a little depressing to like hang out with her. She was also, she kept kosher. I was always doing everything wrong. <laughs> you know, there were a lot more, I mean, she was nice about it, but there were many more rules in her house. Um, so, you know. <laughs> um, did, did you have any DNA analysis that added to your story or augment? I mind? did get my DNA. I did do it. You know, it was really interesting. A lot of Italian and Greek. So one side is the Ashkenazi shows up. Sephardic doesn't show up so well because it's too small of a gene. Did you do a heritage? Or no, I did ancestry. I did ancestry. They come up European Jewish and then they match you to like a Sephardic community. Yeah, and I got a lot of Italian, a lot of Greek, um, a little bit of Spanish, a little bit of um, of Turkish. Um, a little bit of Levant. But the weirdest thing in my ancestry, which I actually think goes to my father's side and raises a bunch of questions, is that I'm apparently, tr I don't totally trust these things, right? You're not supposed to do them anyway. They're probably going into some evil database. Um, but I'm apparently 12% Irish, so. <laughs> Well, so my great grandmother on the Sephardic side was born in Ireland because they were traitors, but it, it says it's on my father's side, so I don't know. You know, I did it sort of as a lark. Like, I don't actually care that much, like, in a way. Like, what is it? I don't know. What is it? What is it signal? But it was sort of interesting. Well, I want to make sure we leave time to sign books and hang out, but yeah, one last question would be perfect. And I'm happy to chat with people after. You, yeah. You've done a magnificent job. Oh, thank you. Uh, very kind. It, it resonates very much for me because I grew up in North Africa. Ah. So even though your story is specific, it is also universal for the whole Mediterranean Yeah, scene. that's great. Thank and, you. And I love it because the characters are very complex. Uh -huh. They have their good side and their bad side. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible to be able to understand how, how, how they were growing up and all those people were living together. Uh, this is a Jewish family, but the, the girls go to the sister of Sion. That's right. Because that's the best education. That's right. You know, yeah. Uh, and I teach at a Catholic college now, so there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and, and it's, it, it, they, they are forward thinking, but at the same time, there's so much superstition. Yeah what is said, what is not said, uh -huh. and if you say it, how you have to repair. Right, yeah, said. all the evil uh, eye and uh, alo, yeah. malo, yeah. Ola. Uh, I don't know how many years you've researched it, but it, it's, and the fact that you have chosen to do it in a fiction, not just a, a biography, um, 
it's it's more enjoyable. I, I can't wait. I haven't finished the book, but <laughs> I can't wait. You're part way in though. Thank you so much. I loved I loved everything you said. I really appreciate it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, what a what a what a great note to end on. Uh, it, it, what you, you can, that's just further evidence. Since once you start the book, you will, you will want to keep reading. Uh, please join me in thanking the New York State Writers Institute for putting all this together for a great season. And thank you to Elizabeth Graver for a great thank night. You, Ed.